In the news this morning, dramatic testimony against accused hijacker Mohammed Hamadi, more gunfire in Burma, and more mudslinging in the presidential race. In sports, Greg Luganis makes a terrific comeback from that bump on the head and brings home his first yeah. Olympic gold medal. Don Cricky reports on that from Seoul. And we'll look at the deciding of one of baseball's division titles. Joe Witte says the remains of Hurricane Gilbert will make for a wet Tuesday in the East. And Alan Abelson looks at what a whole lot of rumors have done to the stock of Time Incorporated. I'm Deborah Norville, and today is Tuesday, September 20th. This is NBC News at Sunrise with Deborah Norville. Good morning. It's been three years since the hijacking of TWA Flight 847 to Beirut. The memory of that ordeal is still vivid for its victims. And today, one of them, who's credited with keeping the situation from becoming worse than it was, testified in Frankfurt. Flight attendant Uli Derrickson today took the stand against accused hijacker Mohammed Hamadi. NBC's Mike Betcher reports on her dramatic testimony. After the hijacking, Derrickson was credited with preventing additional violence on board the TWA jetliner by calming the hijackers and diverting their attention. She was in a position to see much of what the hijackers did on board the aircraft. They jumped me personally with a karate chop against my chest and threw me against the cockpit door and then held the gun at my head, yes. Her role in the hijack episode has made her a key witness against Mohammed Hamadi. This morning, she easily identified him as one of the hijackers. He was the man with the pistol, she testified. He was the one who held the pistol to my head. Derrickson said she remembered that Hamadi was the one who spoke German. The hijacker she nicknamed Castro. Derrickson is the fifth hostage that prosecutors have flown to Germany as they attempt to prove that Hamadi directed the hijacking and was responsible for the murder of U.S. Navy diver Robert Steedham. Hamadi has tried to refute their statements, claiming that testimony of the former hostages has deviated far from the truth. Mike Betcher, NBC News, Frankfurt. Scattered gunfire is reported in the streets of Rangoon today, where as many as 400 demonstrators have died in violence that began Sunday night. Violence erupted after a military junta overthrew the month-old civilian-led government. Lynn Newman has more now from Rangoon. The heavy hand of the military imposed an uneasy calm on the streets of Rangoon today as scattered violence continued in parts of the city and shootings were reported in several areas. Rangoon General Hospital received 10 new deaths in the morning. The hospital morgue now has 30 bodies, but doctors say many more have died and diplomats estimate 300 to 400 dead since the military took power on Sunday. Opposition leaders have requested a meeting with General Sa Mong, the military leader, and the request is under consideration. Students, meanwhile, say they are gathering their forces for a possible counterattack on the army. An evening curfew remains in effect, as the feeling here is that of a calm before the storm. Lynn Newman for NBC News, Rangoon, Burma. And two days after seizing power in a coup, Haiti's new president, General Prosper Avril, has moved to consolidate his power. He has appointed a new cabinet made up of 11 civilians and one army officer. And he has repeated that his goal is the installation of a democratic government. In other news, Japan's Emperor Hirohito is reported to be in critical condition this morning, suffering from hemorrhaging in the digestive tract. Reports from Tokyo say that blood transfusions have failed to stop the hemorrhaging. The 87-year-old Hirohito is the world's longest reigning monarch. And back in this country, it is now five days and counting to the first presidential debate, with each man accusing the other of trying to divide the country. George Bush yesterday charged Michael Dukakis with appealing to class envy. And Dukakis accused Bush of ignoring the average American. NBC's Bob Kerr has more from Houston. The presence of popular Texas Senator Benson on the ticket helps Dukakis here, and when they appeared together before Texas oil men last night, Benson showed why. George Bush will tell you he's an oil man. But when it comes to energy policy, this administration has really drilled a dry hole. Their record is as empty as Dan Quayle's resume. Earlier in Arkansas, Dukakis hit Bush's proposal for a new tax break for the rich. We don't need a warmed-over call to selfishness, and that's why we need a president who will stand up and fight for the average American family. Dukakis challenged Bush to quit speaking about the flag and address real issues, the governor charging that the Republicans have no new ideas. 
And in their hearts, believe me, they know that another four years of Reaganomics would be bad for the country, and four more years of Reaganomics without Reagan would be a disaster. Today, Dukakis plans to detail a proposal for health care and, in coming weeks, more specific proposals. An effort to draw a contrast with the Bush campaign, which has shown it can attack well, but which a top Dukakis aide says has run out of gas. Bob Kerr, NBC News, with the Dukakis campaign in Houston. The Boy Scouts are going to try to do something about the problem of hunger in America. The Scouts hope to collect 100 million cans of food for distribution to various relief agencies this fall. A spokesman says that all levels of Scouts will go door-to-door -door dropping off bags next month. They'll return a few weeks later to collect the bags, filled, they hope, with canned goods. Turning now to sports news, a clincher for Oakland, a win for the Browns, and gold for Greg Luganis. Don Cricky joins us live from Seoul with all of that and more right after this. Here's the sports news this morning. Baseball fans in Oakland are celebrating their team's first championship in seven years. The A's clinched the American League West title last night with a 5-3 win over the defending world champs, the Minnesota Twins. Celebration started when Dennis Eckersley got John Moses on a fly ball to left field. The A's have now won 96 games this season. They've been in first place since April 21st, and they'll meet the Eastern Division winner when the American League playoffs begin October 5th. Their playoff opponent would appear to be the Red Sox, who cut their magic number to seven last night despite a loss to Toronto. Over in the National League East, the Mets did not play, but the second-place Pirates won, so New York's magic number will stay at three. In the West, Oral Hershiser picked his fourth, pitched his fourth straight shutout for his 22nd victory of the year as the Dodgers have now lowered their magic number to five. In Monday Night Football, the Cleveland Browns beat the Indianapolis Colts with the help of a controversial touchdown. Happened late in the second quarter when the score was tied up at 10 apiece. Cleveland's Mike Hagel tosses a pass toward the end zone. The Colts cornerback, Eugene Daniel, appears to have gotten the interception. But Webster Slaughter tries to wrestle the ball away. And the officials say that both players had possession, and under NFL rules, that gives the ball to the offense. So Cleveland went on to a 23-17 win. Turning now over to the Olympics. An amazing recovery is the top story this morning. Don Cricky is in Seoul with that story. Good morning, Don. Good morning, Deborah. As the games of the 24th Olympiad continue, there was a scare for the U.S. men's basketball team. Olympic gold for diver Greg Luganis and a bad deal for a U.S. martial arts competitor. Greg Luganis has now won three gold medals in Olympic diving, but the one awarded him now has to be his most satisfying. After striking his head on the diving board in the preliminary round, Luganis came back with one of the most exceptional efforts of his career to win the gold in three-meter platform. Luganus now has a week to recover before he goes for his next gold medal in platform diving. On the basketball court, the U.S. men's team barely squeaked past a troublesome Canadian squad. U.S. coach John Thompson blamed his team's difficulties on early foul trouble and a poor choice of offensive attack. Taekwondo is only an exhibition sport here in Seoul, but that didn't make winning any less important to American competitor Juan Moreno. Moreno appeared to dominate his Korean opponent, Han Pei Ho, but the judges felt otherwise, awarding the gold to the Korean. Moreno protested before accepting the silver. I guess any other American probably would be proud to have a silver medal in the Olympics, but knowing what I went through, that I feel I should have won the gold medal, I'm not proud of it. I'll probably never wear it again. <laughs> I saw that match, Deborah, and I'll tell you this, if Moreno didn't win, I'm Popeye. But the games overall are going very well. Oh, it's too bad. Don, we'll uh, check in with you tomorrow and find out what news you've got for us then. We'll have plenty. I'm sure you will. Coming up, some stormy conditions far away may mean some weather trouble here at home. Joe Whitty's forecast for Tuesday is next here on NBC News at Sunrise. In Vacaville, California, strong wind gusts have been causing some real problems on the fire line. Gusts of up to 55 miles an hour sent flames over the fire line and led to the evacuation of 500 people. The fire, which officials say has been started by an arsonist, has already destroyed 17,000 acres.
That's the situation in the West. Joe Whitty is here to tell us that there's going to be some rain in the East this morning. That's right, Deborah. Good morning, everyone. Moisture that Hurricane Gilbert pumped into the atmosphere will bring some rain clouds to New York and Pennsylvania on this Tuesday. It's still hurricane season, and they begin way out in the Atlantic, and a disturbance is forming out there. Could be named Tropical Storm Helene by tonight or tomorrow. It's 2,000 miles or a week away from Puerto Rico, but I'll keep an eye on it. Today, a risk of strong thunderstorms in the northeast as a fast-moving cold front associated with former Hurricane Gilbert moves to the east. In the western mountains, some snow above the 65,000-foot level and as far south as Nevada. The Great Plains will be sunny. The warm 80s and 90s stretch from the southern Rockies all the way to New Jersey and the Carolinas. The cold spot, of course, the northern Rockies. L.A. will reach 76 degrees with some morning fog. Denver, 80 with partly sunny skies. That is my national weather. Now here's what's happening in your neighborhood. Dallas, 92, with a risk of afternoon thunder showers. Atlanta, 88, partly cloudy skies. Kansas City, 82, and sunny. Traveling weather coming up next. Deborah. All right, Joe, thanks. On Wall Street these days, they're saying time flies. Up in price, that is. Alan Abelson will take a look at why in just a moment. Bad name. Well, now a group of ranchers out west has decided to do something about it. NBC's Don Oliver this morning takes another look at the progress they seem to be making. Would you care for a sample of our country natural beef? Yeah. Not Antibiotic something you normally beef, see in a supermarket. An Oregon rancher and his wife oh, hawking beef like in front of the meat sound. counter. Yeah, I think it's real good. Better than average or just the same or better than average, I think. But more important, they are trying to find out what the consumer wants and doesn't want in buying beef. Lowell and Mary Foreman are among 24 Oregon Ranch families who have banded together in a unique co-op to try to produce and market beef Americans will buy. It is an effort born because of the poor image beef now has in this health-conscious society. Beef is a desirable product, and what we're trying to do is put a group of ranchers together so we can supply a consistent year-round supply of a quality product that uh, some consumer wants. Doc Hatfield owns a ranch near Brothers in Central Oregon. He and his wife Connie were the driving force behind the formation of Country Natural Beef. It was not easy to get independent ranchers to band together or to be interested in anything other than raising cattle. Okay, I guess we'll call the annual barn meeting order here. But after years of ruinous beef prices, they decided that something needed to be done if they were to survive. And Father, we uh, especially pray that we might know that Country Natural Beef might be a respected organization. They agreed many consumers don't want to eat meat from cattle which have been given growth hormones or antibiotics. Theirs aren't. Through breeding, they have tried to raise and market a smaller steer, which provides a smaller cut of beef for consumers who aren't interested in large portions, and beef which has less fat and less waste. Jim Wakefield had doubts when he first began selling country natural beef. He's sold. It does come in nice and lean, very little trim, and uh, it's natural. Country Natural Beef sells only about 500 cows each year right now. But after two years of experience, the ranchers are convinced that they've hit on a good idea. And they have plans to expand to maybe 7,000 head of cattle within the next few years. I represent a group of ranchers from Central Oregon uh, with 10,000 cows. It is an idea which has caught the attention of the beef industry. The Hatfields were featured speakers at the annual Livestock Industry Congress in Amarillo, offering advice to the leaders of the industry. If the consumer doesn't want it, he said you don't produce it. They're responding right now on a small scale, but they're doing it by the numbers and they're doing it correctly. Although Country Natural Beef is more expensive than some other brands, sales have doubled at this store in the past 18 months. There's just a real health kick, I think, going across the country, and uh, it's very good. In fact, uh, it's all my wife buys now. The challenge for Country Natural Beef will be to grow without losing the responsibility it feels for each and every steak, roast, and pound of hamburger that it sells. Don Oliver, NBC News, Vancouver, Washington. We'll be back with more news in just a moment. Joe Whitty will be here with some of the weather trouble spots around the country. And we'll have our first look at the day's business news. The Wall Street Journal Market Report will be here. And Alan Abelson will be here talking about what's going on at Time Incorporated. 
Stock price has been way up for two days on news of takeovers, news of restructuring. Alan will give us his thoughts in just a moment. Our top story this morning, the testimony of a key witness at the Hamadi hijacking trial. In West Germany today, the positive identification came from flight attendant Uli Derrickson, who said that Hamadi was one of the hijackers and the one who held a pistol to her head during the hijacking. Hamadi is accused of hijacking TWA flight 847 in 1985. During that hijacking, Navy Lieutenant Robert Steedham died. There are reports this morning of scattered gunfire in Rangoon, but Burma's capital city does remain relatively calm. That was not the case yesterday as army troops opened up on demonstrators. Some Western observers say that up to 400 people may have died in the clashes. Protests broke out following Sunday's military coup, which dissolved that month-old civilian government in Burma. And the new cabinet in Haiti has a decidedly civilian look. The new president, Lieutenant General Prosper Avril, named only two military men to his cabinet, saying that democracy is the final objective of the military. Avril took over the government Sunday in a coup that deposed previous president Henri Nomphy. The president, the Senate has given final approval to a bill that would create the world's largest open market. That bill drops most tariffs and other trade restrictions with Canada by the year 1999. One obstacle does remain, approval by Canada, where the bill is stuck in Parliament. Mortgage reform tops our business news this morning. The Department of Housing and Urban Development is cracking down on mortgage profiteers. It plans to sue investors who default on government-insured mortgages in economically troubled areas and then buy new homes at lower prices at government foreclosure sales. A major restructuring by a supermarket giant this morning, the Kroger Company, says that it will go ahead with a new $4 billion restructuring to fend off a bid by the Dart Group. The DART offer for Kroger is $4.36 billion. Profit-taking sent stock prices tumbling in a slow day of trading on Monday. The Dow Jones Industrial Average lost more than 17 points to close at 2,081.08. Standard & Poor's 500 stock index closed at 268.82. That was down almost two points. The Shearson Lehman Long-Term Treasury Bond Index also closed lower. And in London this morning, U.S. Lond bonds are up from the New York close. Looking ahead to today's business, one of the Wall Street Journal's market specials is with us this morning, Kevin Solon. Good morning. Good morning, Deborah. Looking at the markets yesterday, everything was a down day. You think it's going to continue? Well, what you pretty much are sure of here is that you will have another quiet day on Wall Street. People are expecting tomorrow's number on CPI, and they'll pretty much square up their positions going into that. Uh, what do you attribute the big draw and fall yesterday to then? Well, that was pretty much worries about higher inflation rates, uh, mm -hmm. higher interest rates, really. Um, you've been looking at some stocks in particular um, that have had a lot of activity. Greyhound, I think, is one that you've been keeping an eye on. Well, Greyhound falls into the category of most absurd rumor of the day. Oh, yeah? Greyhound was up two bucks yesterday on a rumor that Ron Perlman, the corporate raider, had, was interested in acquiring a company that starts with the letter G. And that's sort of typical of the absurdity of some of the rumors that have been going on on Wall Street lately. <laughs> Wall Street's not a place for the faint of heart. No, not at all. all it's right. a tough place for folks unless you're a professional these days. Okay, Kevin Solon from the Wall Street Journal. Thanks. Thank you, Debbie. In other news this morning, the dollar is mixed in early European trading. It is up against the Japanese yen, trading fractionally lower against the mark, and down just a bit against the British pound. Price of gold at 9 o'clock this morning in London, $411 an ounce. That's up $1.80 from yesterday's New York close. Something's ticking over at time. It went up over a billion dollars in stock value yesterday on rumors. We'll check out the rumor mill with Alan Abelson in just a minute. The rumors are flying fast and furious about Time Incorporated. Stock was up Monday $9 a share for the second consecutive trading day. Word is that somebody would like to take it over, maybe take it private. 
as always, our business reporter, Barron's editor, Alan Abelson, has his ear on Wall Street. What Both are you hearing? Both ears, in fact. <laughs> well, the same old rumors. I mean, there's a recurring rumor. If you want to, you know, be real unpopular at Time Inc. headquarters, just go up there and say, take over, and everybody kind of turns ghastly pale. Mm -hmm. The real trouble is, I think, that this company is really worth a lot more than the market is evaluated it for. You know, it has, it's the second biggest cable company. It's, uh, of course, a leading magazine publishing company, it has a big book publishing division. Mm -hmm. All those things, communications generally, are very hot these days in Wall Street. And Why all of a sudden now, though? I mean, Time has had all of these various divisions for a long, long time. Well, I think maybe the guys got tired of just sitting around doing nothing and kicked a few rumors around. It's hard to say. If something's really cooking, then, of course, the stock could go up another 40, 50 points. You know, the rumor, I mean, it's an office pool kind of thing. How much do you think it's worth? $200 a share, $230 a share. The same analysts who were talking $125 a year ago have raised their sides now. One thing strikes me, Deborah, that if this proves true, if either the company goes private in order to keep from, they're really scared to death of being taken over, or somebody makes a bid for it, then the SEC really get, ought to get off its stuff and do something. I mean, you know... What can they do, though? Well, they can trace who bought the stock ahead of time, because this is really an outrageous rumor. I mean, some guy pays 300 bucks or gets 300 bucks on poor printer and gets tossed in the hooskow because he, you know, uh, leaks some information. Now, we're talking billions of dollars mm -hmm. here, so I think somebody really ought to be on the hot seat. Well, we heard Kevin Solomon just say that, that Greyhound was up two bucks mm -hmm. yesterday on the rumor that, that Perlman was looking at a stock that started with G. Some of these rumors are absolutely absurd. That's right. But this one, you know, you don't usually, when you have this sort of money going into this sort of stock, after all, we're talking about $100 a share, which means that not every kid in the block can really play with that stock. If time is going to take itself private, won't it have to make that move soon because the stock is getting more expensive every day? Well, you know, that's one of the things they try and do. They bought in their own stock, they went through a restructuring, they sold off the division. They'd like to see the stock up because that will make it more difficult for somebody to take it over. Mm -hmm. I think ultimately they would like to go private. But it's a lot of dough, and they'd have to take on a lot of debt, no where, question. Where would this fall in, in line of size of takeovers, if there were a takeover It would time? certainly be one of the biggest ever, and it would be probably the biggest, by far, the biggest publishing takeover, communications company takeover ever. Well, keep your eyes and both your ears on I certainly will. Keep us posted. <laughs> okay, Deborah. Talk to you tomorrow. And here's Joe Whitty with a look at some of today's travel delays. Deborah, on this Tuesday, folks taking a plane ride have a risk of finding a few wet and trouble spots due to the weather. Morning radar shows storms moving to the northeast through Pennsylvania and New York. So possible delays this morning. Boston due to some morning fog. New York City afternoon thunderstorm possibility. Charlotte some morning fog. And way out west, Spokane, Washington, a little fog. Deborah. All right, Joe, thanks a lot. Finally this morning, one more Olympic story. This one from Lufkin, Texas, where the 17th annual Hush Puppy Olympics is set for this weekend. Lufkin, you can well imagine, is at a fever pitch preparing for this big event in which cookers of fried corn balls compete to see who's best. Organizers say they're hoping for 400 million spectators at the event. They say they'll be happy if maybe 10,000 show up. That's NBC News at sunrise for this Tuesday morning. I'm Deborah Norville. Thanks for being with us. Have a good day. We'll see you tomorrow.